So before we talk about gas in Ethereum, we first need to take a quick detour into undergraduate computer science and talk about the halting problem. Now, just for demonstration purposes, I'm going to create a new file called temp.js. And what the halting problem states is that it is impossible to write a function that determines whether or not another function runs indefinitely or whether that function terminates at any given point. So to put that in an example of code, it is impossible to write a function halts that takes another function f as an argument. And this function halts will return true if f terminates or halts at any given time, and it will return false if f is infinite and loops indefinitely. This function is effectively impossible to write. Now you could just take my word for it that this is the case, but I think it's actually interesting to explore why this is. And before we dive into the halting problem, there's just one aside I want to explain about how JavaScript works, and that's how it evaluates parameters in a conditional expression. So in this example, I have a function called condition1, which is just a function that returns true, a function called condition2, which is just a function that returns true, and then an if statement that says if condition1 and condition2, then we're going to console.log the statement is true. And if I ran this code in doing node temp.js, we see the statement is true, which is what we would expect. Now I'm going to add a console.log statement here that says condition2 is being evaluated. And I'm going to copy this um, console log statement above to condition1 as well that says condition1 is being evaluated. And if I run the code now, we will see condition1 is being evaluated, condition2 is being evaluated, and the statement is true, and that makes logical sense as we would expect. But here's where this becomes interesting, is if condition one does not return true and it instead returns false, and I run the statement, well, we'll see that condition two is never even being evaluated. It's never even called. Um, condition one is called, it returns false, and this kind of makes sense because if we know that the first condition of the and statement is false, there's no need to even call the second one. We know that this entire conditional will be false. So I'm going to blow these away and I'm going to create two new functions. One called returns true, which is just a function that returns true, and one called infinite loop, which is a function that has an infinite wall loop and will loop forever. And we're going to do a little proof by contradiction here, which means we're going to assume that we could write the function halts. Um, we're going to use it in our code and then we're going to show why that code makes no sense. So I'm going to create a, another function called contradiction. And this is a function that if we assumes that we could in fact write the halts function, and we're going to call halts on contradiction recursively and infinite loop. And although this probably makes no sense to you and it's not meant to, it's meant for demonstration purposes, um, this is valid JavaScript code. You can uh, write functions this way. Okay, so now that we have this contradictory statement, um, let's look at what our assumptions are. This halts of contradiction could either return true or it could return false. There's nothing else it could do. So we could assume that halts contradiction returns true, or we could assume that it returns false. And let's look at the implications of both those assumptions. So if we assume that halts of contradiction returns true, then we would, we would expect for the next part of the and statement to get evaluated, which is the infinite loop like we saw before, because um, if the first part returns true, it will evaluate the second part. Well, if this infinite loop gets called, then this function contradiction is going to loop forever, um, which means that this original halts of contradiction part should have returned false. So that makes no sense. This returns true the first time, but it should have actually returned false. That clearly can't be the case. So maybe we just made the wrong assumption. Maybe halts of contradiction actually returns false. Well, if halts of contradiction returns false, then remember, infinite loop is never going to even get evaluated. So if this returned false, then this entire statement will return false, which means that contradiction did in fact terminate. So this halts of contradiction should be true, but it returned false. So you see that even if we assume that it returned false, then it would have to have been true at some point. So that makes no sense either. And because this is valid JavaScript code, the only assumption that we made that could possibly be leading to this illogical result is that this function is actually impossible to write. So when Ethereum was first conceived, they had to find a workaround to this halting problem because the Ethereum virtual machine allows for arbitrary computation of other people's code. 
And because it's impossible to statically analyze code and determine whether or not it will terminate in finite time, it led to the very real possibility that the Ethereum network could be DDoSed pretty easily by people deploying infinite loops and people wasting computational resources trying to determine if the loops were infinite. So Ethereum came, comes up with a very clever workaround to this, which is the concept of gas. So the code that runs the contracts on the Ethereum network is the byte code of the Ethereum virtual machine. So if you're writing contracts in a language like Solidity, it's going to compile your contracts down into something that looks like this which is a series of EVM opcodes. Now, the full list of EVM opcodes is defined in the Ethereum yellow paper, but this is absolutely fucking terrifying to look at, so I will normally refer to the stack exchange list. And like you say, this is a series of all the opcodes that the EVM can execute. Now, each opcode that the EVM can execute has a fixed amount of gas associated with it. You can think of this as a fee per computational step that you execute on the network. For example, uh, taking the SHA-3 hash of a string costs 30 gas, and that is fixed. It'll always cost 30 gas to take the SHA hash of a string. Um, generating a transaction, for example, this GTX right here, uh, will cost 21,000 gas to do. So if you wanna send ether from one account to another, that's 21,000 gas. Now, you can dive deeper into the individual opcodes, and we will at a later point. But the higher arching idea here is that you pay for the computation that you do. And it is the burden of whoever is calling functions on the Ethereum network to pay for the computational cost of executing those functions. And this will shield the network against DDoS attacks. So whenever you call functions, on Ethereum, including just sending transactions or sending Ether to someone, you need to include a little bit extra Ether to pay for the computational cost. Now, the amount of gas per computational step is fixed, but the amount of Ether you pay for it is not. And this normally trips people up a little bit. There is an exchange rate of gas to Ether that is determined by the miners on the network. You can go to fstats.net to see a list of statistics about the Ethereum network in real time, including what is called the gas price. Now, the gas price is just a dynamic exchange rate of ether to gas. So the, the gas is fixed as a cost per computational step, but the actual market value of that uh, is dynamic. So right now the gas price is 20 Gway, which is two times 10 to the negative eighth ether. Um, and let's just walk through an example real quick of determining how much it would actually cost in Ether to generate a transaction, and maybe that will help make this make a little bit more sense. So if I back, go back and open my console, we know that it costs 21,000 gas to execute a transaction. So how much is 20 Gway in way? Well, we can do that by web 3 uh 20 Gway. And that is that much way. And then we can multiply that by 21,000, which gives us that. And then we can web3 dot from way that in ether. And we'll see that sending a transaction costs 0 0.00042 ether, which at the current market price of Ethereum is significantly less than a tenth of a penny. So it's a minuscule amount to actually send a transaction. 